Good afternoon. I'm Stan Sklaroff, the Dean of Arts and Sciences, and it's my pleasure to welcome you all to the Gittner Family Lecture. At, that's part of the lecture series of the College of Arts and Sciences. This is a special weekend for us as we celebrate the 150th anniversary of the founding of our college. So I'm especially thrilled to welcome you this, this afternoon. Um, and how fitting a lecture, or sorry, a panel discussion uh, for this, this period that we're living in. Uh, but what you'll find is that the questions that are discussed are enduring questions and they get to the heart of what it is to be human. Um, that part of historical questions that have existed for quite some time. Um, it's been a truly wonderful weekend to celebrate the 150th birthday. Uh, for 150 years, we've embraced the liberal arts and sciences, bringing together disparate areas of expertise to debate, question, and explore pressing issues in our world. I can think of no better panel topic and a panel of faculty from a variety of backgrounds all discussing one of the preeminent questions in our society today, what does it mean to be human in the world of AI? Today's panel includes faculty from religion, philosophy, economics, and psychology, and brain sciences. The panel discussion will not focus on current advances in generative models like ChatGPT. It won't. And questions, hopefully, will focus on the broader topics that the panel has been asked to think about and to discuss and debate today. How do humans perceive AI? How might AI shape the future of work? What are the boundaries between humans and AI? In short, this panel will focus on what defines humanness and how AI challenges or reinforces those understandings. A little bit about the lecture itself. I wanna thank Jerry Gittner and his family for making this event possible. The annual Gittner Family Lecture was established to highlight current BU faculty members whose teaching and research addresses topics of major importance for the broad interest and benefit of the BU community. We are very fortunate to have alumni like Jerry who can support and facilitate the opportunities for us to gather and to engage as a community on critical topics like today's. A dedicated alumnus, Jerry Gittner, class of 66, graduated with a BA in history and was elected to Phi Alpha Theta, the National Historical History Honor Society. He's a trustee emeritus of Boston University and a current member of the CAS Dean's Advisory Board and the Pardee Dean's Advisory Board. Jerry is a principal of Cross Continental Capital. He serves as chairman of Global Aero Holdings Limited and DG Associates. Among other roles, he has served as CEO and chairman of the board of Transworld Airlines, vice chairman of Pan American World Airways, CEO of Pan Am World Services, and president and co-founder of People Express Airlines. This past summer, when one of our interns interviewed Jerry as part of our preparations for our 150th anniversary celebration, Jerry responded, Coming to my career from a degree in history, rather than business or engineering, I had a very different perspective. Fine arts, music, languages, I was analytical. I knew how to think and question. One of my mantras is, it's not the answer, it's the question that is critical. In the College of Arts and Sciences, we have learned how to ask the right questions. In the spirit of asking the right questions, I'm going to introduce our moderator and let her get the discussion started. I'm pleased to introduce our moderator today, Margarita Guillory, Associate Professor of Religion and the newly appointed Associate Director of Digital Technology at the BU Center for the Humanities. Margarita's research focuses on identity construction in Africana esoteric religions, religion and technology, and social scientific approaches to religion. 
She's the author of Social and Spiritual Transformation in African American Spiritual Churches and co-editor of Esotericism in African American Religious Experience. Her current project, Africana Religion in the Digital Age, considers how African Americans utilize the internet, social media, mobile applications, and gaming to forge new ways to express their religious identities. I'll hand this over to Margarita and let her introduce the rest of the panel and begin the discussion. I hope you enjoy it. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you for that wonderful introduction. Serving as moderator slash panelist, I thought I was going to have to introduce myself, <laughs> and that seemed like, I thought that was gonna be a bit weird, so <laughs> thank you for that. Now I want to introduce the rest of this phenomenal um, panel. Um, first we have um, Rachel Powell. Um, Rachel is the director of the Center for Philosophy and History of Science and professor in the Department of Philosophy at Boston University. She works primarily at the intersections of evolutionary biology, medicine, and ethics. And her recent books include Contingency and Convergence Toward a Cosmic Biology of Body and Mind with MIT Press and The Evolution of Moral Progress, a Biocultural Theory with Oxford University Press. She was also a lawyer and a past life, but doesn't like to talk about that. <laughs> so maybe during the reception, you can talk to Rachel about her past life. Next, we have Rachel Dennison, an assistant professor of psychological and brain sciences at Boston University, where she directs the Dennison Lab. Her lab studies visual perception, attention, and decision-making with a focus on how the brain generates visual experience in real time. Her research aims to link behavior to neural activity using computational models, integrating approaches from experimental psychology, human cognitive neuroscience, computational neuroscience, and cognitive science. She holds a BA, from Yale University, and a Master's of Science from the University of Oxford, where she was a Marshall Scholar, and a PhD from the University of California, Berkeley, with a postdoctoral training at NYU. Her research has been supported by, by the NIH, the National Science Foundation, and the Templeton World Charity Foundation. And last, but certainly not least, Pascal Restrepo. Perfect. All right, I've been practicing, you yeah. guys. <laughs> Is an associate professor of economics whose research interests span labor and macroeconomics. His current research examines the impact of technology and, in particular, of automation on labor markets, employment, wages, inequality, the distribution of income, and growth. So I give you, and then myself, the panel. So the way that we are imagining, that, so this is going to be a conversation among us. We have at least six selected questions that, that we've generated. We may not get to all of the questions. Um, we start with a very broad question, particularly the one that sort of this panel was sort of organized around. And then we sort of take a, a funnel structure where we get to more nuanced detailed specified types of questions that were generated under the umbrella of the, the broad question. And I think maybe 35 minutes we will talk, 40 minutes, and then we will have 20 minutes to hear from you, questions that you may have. Now it's, this is really important to us as a panel because we've all probably served on panels where the panelists talked on and on and on, and we didn't, and the audience never had an opportunity to enter into the conversation. That will not be the case today. You will have 20 minutes to, to be able to converse with us about what you've heard or, or questions you just may have about the subject matter. 
So we start with a very broad question. What does it mean to be human in the world of AI? What does it mean to be human in the world of AI? <laughs> okay, so all right, I'll have a start. It's, it seems really important because you said it twice. Yes, okay. um, and then I looked at you, right? <laughs> yeah, so, so I'm gonna be sort of the annoying analytic philosopher and deconstruct the question. So what do we mean when we're asking, what does it mean to be human in light of such and such, right? So one thing we could be asking is, well, how are human life ways gonna change in light of some events? But the thing is, you could ask that about pretty much any technology that impacts on society, so surely we mean to, to be asking something much deeper than that. Something like, mm -hmm. how will our conception of humanity itself be transformed by some new scientific knowledge or the introduction of a new technology? Okay, so now that's good. Now we're in more interesting philosophical territory. Um, but altering our conception of humanity itself is no small feat, right? So to do this, science or technology has to, I think, fundamentally change how we think about what we are or how we came to be or where we're going. In essence, it has, to, it has to basically transform the way we understand our place in the scheme of nature. And I think that the best examples of this sort of thing come from revolutions in our scientific picture of the universe, in particular from major discoveries in astronomy, biology, and cognitive science that have had a profound what you might call decentering effects. So, you know, famously Copernicus showed that the sun, not the earth, is the center of the solar system. Hubble showed that uh, our galaxy is simply one, one of the mill galaxies among what we now know to be billions or more of galaxies. Darwin showed that the human species is just a tiny twig on this arborescent tree of life that evolved and continues to evolve under blind mechanisms of evolution disabusing us of the notion that our human existence was preordained or that there's some deep, unalterable essence uh, to what it is to be human. More recently, biology, people may be less familiar with these, but biology has shown that animals like us are actually just massively uh, symbiotic collectives that are built out of once free-living bacterial lineages. So basically, we're just giant, fancy bacteria. And work in comparative cognition on animals has shown that many non-human animals actually have uh, incredibly rich mental lives, including, perhaps most surprisingly, small-brained invertebrates like insects. So what all these intellectual revolutions have in common, I think, is that again and again, they're knocking humanity off its throne. They're basically relocating us from a place of privileged centrality to the status of garden variety. They're obliterating our human-centered worldview basically leaving us disoriented as we struggle to figure out how to recalibrate um, our place in the cosmos. Now, I think technologies are very rarely going to do something like that, but I think also that AI is an exception. It's not merely socially transformative. It also is challenging these core notions of uh, what we are as embodied thinking things. It makes us think about the prospect of intelligence in the absence of consciousness, of consciousness in the absence of emotions, and it compels us to think about what it is that makes beings like us morally valuable in the first place. So for us, these features, intelligence, consciousness, value, they come as one sort of big evolved package, but for AI, they may very well come apart. But perhaps most importantly, the last thing I'll say about this is that I think AI presents us uh, with an opportunity for transcendence. And by that I mean that it, it, it can take us beyond the sort of self-indulgent questions like, what does it mean to be human, and invite us to consider forms of minds and ways of beings that we never could have imagined. So that's my take on the question. That's wonderful. I was, um, you know, this question, I thought about it, and I want to situate my response to the, to the question um, with, I want to situate it in my areas of study, uh, which is um, digital religion studies, where scholars who are in this field, we look at the nuanced intersections between emerging digital technologies and religion. 
defined broadly, but then very specified sort of understanding of religiosities. And then my second response to this question will be situated in the ways in which race enters into this conversation. So intersections between race, racialized sort of bodies, how they intersect in this sort of relationship that's going on between digital technologies and religion. So my question is, you know, how does AI impact how people practice religion? This is a question that in my class, religion in the digital age, we talk about. And so we see robotics, for instance, being utilized within religious institutions. We see robots being utilized in Buddhist um, temples to sort of transmit Buddhist teachings. <clears throat> We see robots like Santos in, in Poland being utilized to almost a, it serving a confessional capacity where you're able to ask Santos these questions, even really deep sort of existential type of questions, and Santos gives you a response without the priest being there, mind you. And then you have wonderful AI-generated applications like RoboRabbi. Yes, that's the thing, right? <laughs> Robo rabbi. And, you know, authority figures in these, you know, <laughs> these respective traditions are okay with the utilization of these robots. They were like, good, they do certain things that we don't really have to deal with now. They can sort of disseminate the teachings, they can give the verses, but they will never ever replace us as the religious authority figures. And in my class, we talk about why is that the case? And they're really adamant about that, that human agents are necessary in these systems, that robots cannot totally run religious institutions. Religious authorities need to be there. And what we find with many of them, even though they agree with the utilization of them in these spaces, the way in which they distinguish themselves from these potential religious authorities, robots, is that they don't have a soul. So for them, this is the distinction, that these robots can sort of perform these tasks, but they are missing a certain type of life essence that is needed when you are trying to help a practitioner or a parishioner or someone that's trying to negotiate sort of the realities of life, that a robot cannot sort of do that. Only a person with a certain life essence can do that. Now, that's one part of my, my response to, to the question. But the question is, what does it mean to be human in the world of AI? If I look at this from critical race th theory, my question is, how do, how do we, I have a different question to ask. How do we look at people, people, communities, individuals who are not seen as human? For instance, marginalized communities, in my study, African Americans, whose humanities, even in 2023, is questioned because they're constantly being subjected to structural forms or personalized forms of dehumanization. So how do these bodies and these lives that are constantly being dehumanized, how do they fit into a question like this? Because the way in which the question is being asked is that there's this monolithic sort of understanding of what it means to be human, but on the ground, that, term, that terminology, human, is not a monolith. It's not. My bodily reality as a human is very different than someone else who is not in a body that's quite like mine. So what am I saying with this second response? I'm saying that we have to nuance the question. We have to challenge the question even more and sort of push it beyond sort of monolithic representations. Did anyone else, did anyone want to add to that? <laughs> so our second question is, what are the differences between 
machine and human intelligence? Does consciousness make us special and, and different from machines? I can start here. Um, so intelligence, consciousness, uh, these, these are big words. Um, people use them in many different ways. So let me give some working definitions for the purpose of this conversation. Um, let's start with intelligence. So intelligence is often operationalized by performance. What can this machine do? Can it play chess? Can it pass the LSATs? Can it have a conversation, etc.? And so one way of asking this question of comparing human and machine intelligence is what are the kinds of tasks that AIs can do and are they the same kind of tasks that humans can do? Um, and I think the answer is, of course, yes and no at this moment in history. AIs right now are doing really well at natural language processing, at image processing, but not so well on tasks that involve flexible behavior in the real world. So you might have noticed that you can't hire an AI robot to walk your dog, um, unfortunately, maybe one day. Another way of asking this question then is for the kinds of tasks that AIs can do, are the internal mechanisms that they use to do those tasks similar to the internal mechanisms that humans use? And of course, the internal mechanisms of humans and AIs are in some respects have to be very different, but it's actually an active research area to investigate what are the computational principles that underlie the ability of AIs to do certain tasks and how do they compare to the computational principles used by humans? And we could talk about that more in the Q&A if anyone's interested. Um, but I think an even more important question to ask is what do AIs know? What do they actually um, understand? Uh, are, they, are they thinking in the way that we um, think as humans? And I think underneath all of these questions is really a question about meaning. When I say um, the sky is blue, it means something because it refers to an actual sky in the world. And I know about skies. I understand what a sky is based on my life experiences. I understand what the color blue is based on my life experiences. And I understand a kind of mapping and structural relationship between those things. Now, ChatGPT has a language model. I know we weren't supposed to talk about <laughs> ChatGPT, but you might wonder. ChatGPT has a language model um, that it has learned based on training from a massive amount of human-generated text. Um, and we don't know at this point, does that model um, contain a meaningful structure a uh, structure that's found in the real world? Or is it just, okay, this string of words is more probable than that string of words. Mm -hmm. So this string of words is the one I'm going to spit out next. Okay, that's intelligence. This was a two-part question. Con okay, next is consciousness. So what is consciousness? Um, so consciousness is our first-person subjective experience of the world. Um, there is something that it is like for me to be me. There is something that it's like for you to be you. Um, and these are private experiences that we have in, inside. 
when I stub my toe, I feel pain in my toe. Um, but happily for you, you don't feel the pain in my toe, right? So um, we know that brains create consciousness. I think, therefore, I am, right? We know that brains create consciousness. But we, we don't yet have a scientific theory of how that happens. We don't know how consciousness is generated by the brain. And that means we don't know whether consciousness is something that has to come from brains or whether it could come from a machine, from an AI, if that machine were designed and built in exactly the right kind of way. And of course, consciousness is special. Um, it's what makes our lives matter to ourselves. Imagine if you had to choose between being um, paralyzed but conscious versus being able to move but being unconscious like a zombie. Um, which would you choose? Not that you, either of these is a great option, but most people would choose to be conscious. Consciousness matters, and so we really need to advance our scientific theories of consciousness and how it comes about in order to answer the question of is it, it, could it ever be possible for an AI to be conscious? Okay, so maybe I'll jump in too. Great. But I, I, I didn't want to go down this road, but um, I, I always ask my students um, in some of my classes, if you're going to participate in a brain transplant, do you want to be the donor or the recipient? Mm. And it's, I mean, I don't know if it's a trick question, but if you basically say, oh, I want to be the recipient, because usually it's good to get a, an organ, right, uh, rather than to give one, um, but then, of course, you're dead. Um, because your brain's been discarded and now someone else's brain is in your body um, and they're like, oh, look at my new body. This is weird and interesting, but okay, I'm still the same person. But I have students that will just insist, no, it's the body that matters. Like, mm. So it's just, it's interesting mm. that people have these different um, yeah. intuitions about that. Um, so I guess like I want to um, pick up on the questions of intelligence a little bit on consciousness. Um, so, <clears throat> um, yeah, so this... Uh, as Rachel said, like the concept of intelligence has been very fraught, um, ethically problematic too in the human context. Um, been debated since the 1980s, but um, I, I'm sort of thinking about it more from the standpoint of the evolutionary cognition sciences, um, which I think has more or less coalesced, coalesced around um, a definition a universal definition of general intelligence. So a lot of people say there's no such thing as general intelligence at all. It's not helpful. Think about intelligence in specific domains. That's all you can do. But in comparative cognition, that's working mostly on, on animal cognition, the evolution of mind, um, they've sort of settled on this definition that basically uh, intelligence is a capacity to think and act flexibly in the service of one's goals. And it's especially uh, relevant that it's the it's the ability to come up with novel solutions to problems that are not like in the ordinary course that you're, that's what you're normally exposed to. Um, and it's not part of your ordinary repertoire. So the whole idea is that in, what intelligence is for, as a, from a general standpoint is flexible problem solving. It's not like raw computational power. It's not like some hyper super specialized skill, okay? And, <clears throat> And if AI is going to end up having uh, some kind of a science fiction like impact um, on our world, like there are going to be real robot rabbis, right, and so forth, um, it's probably going to have to, it's going to be in the form of this general artificial intelligence, right? Mm -hmm. um, but thus far, there's no um, existing machines that have those kinds of flexibilities. So you have like, there are, of course, you know, going back to Deep Blue, there are, there are machines that could defeat any human alive in chess. There are machines that could defeat any human alive in Go, 
in these kinds of games, right? We used to think that those were like general intelligence indicators, but in fact, it, they're really not. Um, because these, these, at least when the machines are doing it, because these, the machines that can defeat any human alive in chess, they can't even adapt to like a new game of chess with a slight variation. So they're just not, obviously they're not operating on the kind of intelligence um, that we're talking about. Whereas in animals, quite the, quite the contrary. So like even as I sort of was hinting at, because I work on insects, so it's gonna keep coming up, I apologize. But like even in like small-brained invertebrates like bees, there's remarkable, remarkable degrees of learning concept acquiring, categories, applying them across different domains, different sensory modalities. Like, so, I mean, even these pretty, uh, you know, absolutely small brain animals are capable of this kind of general intelligence, but that's way beyond anything, as far as I understand, that's way beyond any kind of, you know, flexibility that any machines we've been able to create. Um, but we'd have to know a ton about like the individual systems and that's not my area of expertise. So maybe there are systems that are more flexible, but it doesn't, it doesn't really look like that. Um, now you could be super, super intelligent in the definitions that I just gave, right? This flexible problem solving, but it doesn't say anything about whether you're conscious, right? Um, and unlike this, the concept of intelligence, which does get sort of nicely conceptualized and operationalized in different fields and consciousness is just all over the place and there's just there's no scientific consensus whatsoever about the nature of consciousness about its biological underpinnings um, but the thing is on on most accounts and I think it's probably correct consciousness is a necessary condition for having morally protectable interests for being part of the moral community, for taking your interest into account. And so like, we can't avoid the question really, right? We have this, this question of machine consciousness, just like animal consciousness, um, is hugely consequential. But one of the problems is that um, we can't, in, like with humans, we can infer consciousness some, to some extent reliably by just verbal reports, right? I tell you, I'm experiencing this auditorium right now or whatever. Um, but in machines, it's a really big problem because we can't just look at behaviors of machines. So sometimes we infer consciousness from behaviors of different kinds of animals and so forth, and to some extent, we, we might be able to do that. But with machines, uh, like these AI systems especially, that becomes really dicey because we can't take their word for it that you know, they say they're having some experience when they say that because these are machines that are specifically designed to mimic human conscious states, to mimic Human, human interactions. And um, so, you know, you, you can program a robot to like cringe when you, when you kick it, right? But that doesn't mean that it's cringing is a good indicator that it's actually in pain. It's just basically rigged to fool us. And that's the case for AI, I, as far as I understand, in many cases too. So we can't just look at their verbal reports. We need to look at something else. And so thankfully you have, you know, to a whole bunch of scientific theories of consciousness that kind of run the gamut, but a lot of them are like computational, functional, and uh, you can take like, and people have done this, like they've, they've had a published a report recently, like tons of neuroscientists, philosophers, cogn you know, cognitive scientists and so forth, and um, they just basically went and said like, okay, like let's take every major scientific theory of consciousness, look at its empirical predictions, look at what it says the functional Struck, cognitive structure should look like uh, for conscious experience and they, they come up, each one has different kind of predictions, but if you look at all of them, none of the existing machines meet the criteria, you know, for the kinds of functions that would indicate or that we associate with conscious experience. And at least so far, that's not saying anything about where we're going. We're just saying right this moment, we were joking earlier that by Monday, everything we say may be obsolete, right? Um, but yeah, but I think it's a legitimate question. The last thing I'll say is that it's a legitimate question whether um, AI in anything like its current AI enterprise, the technology, the approaches, in anything like its current form is going to be capable of achieving general intelligence or be capable of achieving consciousness. Um, that's, that's an open question. Um, and that's something that we, you know, we may talk about later.
So um, how do the boundaries we draw between humans and animals, and we sort of talked, um, Rachel, you sort of talked about this a little, um, differ from the boundaries we draw between humans and artificial intelligence? And um, why are we so interested in drawing these boundaries in the first place? Like why? Yeah, I can uh, build a little on what Rachel said earlier. So, you know, I think it, I think it is a very human thing to be slightly obsessed about the question of what makes us human as opposed to something else. And a f major focus historically has been on what makes us different from other animals. Um, the sort of major way that we've gone about answering this question is, you know, okay, maybe the thing that distinguishes us from other animals is something about our intelligence. We've kind of leaned into this intelligence idea. Um, and I love this, uh, you know, it's something that it hasn't always worked out so well, as, as Rachel was saying, there have been over the years many proposals for the thing that sets us apart from animals. Things like tool use, um, language, or recognizing ourselves in a mirror. You know, one, a one after the other, these proposals have been made, but then soon enough, we discover that animals can do these things too at least to some degree. Um, there's a great quote from the anthropologist Louis Leakey who, um, who, said, who said this after it was discovered that chimpanzees can use tools. And I think it really illustrates the importance that had been placed on the idea that tool use is this like, uniquely human capacity um, so Leakey said, well, now we have to uh, redefine tools or <laughs> redefine man or accept chimpanzees as human, right? It seemed like those were the only three options. Um, so suffice it to say that we, we, we've gone all in to some degree on this idea that um, something about intelligence is what, is what sets us apart, is what makes us human. Now, AI comes along um, and displays all these intelligent behaviors, perhaps not uh, to the you know, extent of this general, flexible, problem-solving type of intelligence, but some pretty in impressive feats that are indistinguishable from human behavior. And um, so, no, so you know, now we're, we're in a predicament. If we take the leaky formulation, is it that we either have to redefine intelligence, redefine man, or accept AIs as human, you know. Um, oh no, and in the recent conversations that have been going on about AI, you might have heard this kind of backpedaling taking place in the conversation. People say, oh, maybe it's not intelligence uh, that makes us special or that makes us different. Maybe it's something else. Maybe it's consciousness. Maybe it's emotion, et cetera. And so I think you can see the, the problem with this kind of boundary drawing, which is looking for the one thing, you know, the one thing that makes us different or that makes us special. Where, when in fact, humans, we are not one thing. We're, we're many things. Um, we're complicated, right? If I think about um, the topics we might cover in a class in the Department of Psychological and Brain Sciences here at BU, it's a long list. You know, as humans, we perceive the world around us, we experience emotions, we remember our pasts, we plan for our futures. Um, we grow and learn and uh, change 
and develop over the course of our, our lifespans. We engage in social interactions, we participate in communities, we have these brains that are intimately integrated with our bodies. Um, all of these things are important components of what it is to be human and a lot of them are things we share to a large degree with animals. Um, but not so much things that we share with AIs. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, can I just pick yes, up on that real yes, quick? Please. And I know we should get to yes, questions real yes. quick. Um, but yeah, so I mean, to me, um, the, the way that the, that the boundary should be drawn, even when we're asking this question, is not like, well, we have humans over here, and then we have animal and, animals and AI over there. But rather, I think that the big boundary is between organisms and machines. Um, and there are fundamental differences between organisms and machines, which I think ultimately may translate into really big differences in intelligence and big differences in the possibilities for, for consciousness. And mm -hmm. so, um, the difference is not so much that, um, that uh, we're made out of different stuff, that we have different molecular substrates per se, right? We're, organisms are, are uh, carbon-based, but, um, uh, but machines may be silicon-based. It's not about that. It's about what the substrate allows you to do and what it, how it functions that matters. And the big difference is that organisms are very different than machines because they live in the realm of, and they have to contend with aqueous biochemistry, the chaos of the cell. And so organisms as a result are in this flowing situation. They're always in flux. They're constantly repairing their cell, themselves. They're constantly healing. They're constantly battling for persistence, for survival, against the vagaries of the environment, against the chaos of the flow. And that couldn't be more different than the way machines are designed. And it may be very well the case that things like consciousness, things like intelligence, as we're talking about it and understand it, may be things that emerge from that kind of a flow, which organisms are basically bending in the service of self-maintenance, reproduction, things like that. And machines don't do anything like that, right? And I think that it may be that you know, if, if things like general intelligence and consciousness are intimately related to those kinds of cellular process flows, which some people actually think they are, um, then they're never going to be realized by machines that have sort of, uh, you know, uh, whose substrate is basically a visible circuitry, right? Because that's not the scale at which uh, the important things about life occur. Um, and that's why machines are just brittle, they have parts, the parts fall apart, they need external engineers with their intentions and desires to come into play and to fix them and to make sure that they persist. Um, organisms are the exact opposite. Um, and that's so fundamental and that's why, that's why Rachel's saying, oh, humans and animals in many ways are so much more, I mean, so much more similar. I can't even begin to, to, to describe that. And so, you know, it might be that in the future, so if we were contemplating, well, what would it be like if in the future we have machines that we can see, not just molecular machines, right, but machines that we can see, macrobes, right, um, that are able to instantiate those kinds of cellular style processes, right? Um, what would that be like? would you say that machines are now conscious? And I think, no, mm. you wouldn't say that machines are now conscious. You would say machines are no longer machines. Okay. That's that it. is very interesting. And I, I, I want to go to our next question, but you know, thinking about your comment, particularly you know, sort of this distinction between organism and machine, I, I have this cyborgian sort of <laughs> you know, um, question and, and we, we can sort of deal with it at the reception, but I just thought about like what happens when those two worlds come together. So I spend a considerable, way more time than I should studying biohacking. Um, and so what happens when you bring machine and human body together? 
and not just in a really simple way where you're just you just have a magnet under you know in you know in, in your skin under your skin so you can open your door or you know swipe your phone but I mean something like a neural link like what do we do with that when you are we're talking FDA approval chips in the brain the surgery is being done by the machine but what happens to those distinct boundaries between organism and machine when there's hybridity within the human body? Those, that's, that's a question for you to think about. <laughs> we can talk about it at the reception. Um, but I want to get Pascal here into, in the conversation. And um, I, I think, do, do you want to go to work? Uh, I think we should go to this one next, um, Pascal. Um, should we view AI systems as our descendants? This is going to be an interesting one. <laughs> With their own objectives that they should pursue freely, yep, or as tools controlled by us and aligned with our objectives? I think we, Pascal is going to need to talk about work. Yeah. You want to talk because about work? Yeah, I can talk about yeah, work. Okay, there's a lot, okay, there's a lot okay. In that. So we'll I want us to come back to that question, yes. though, because yes. I think we all can sort of <laughs> maybe <laughs> grapple with that question a little mm -hmm. bit more. So um, will AI, and we all can jump in here, but Pascal, this is, I want to direct this to you. Will AI eliminate work as we know it? Um, is this time different from previous technological revolutions? And how will we use our time and, I love this, define our identities in a world without work? Perfect. So I can take that one. You can take that one. <laughs> okay, great. So I want to make three points. So first I want to explain how technology has redefined human work through history and why we still have so many jobs despite the fact that we've already automated many tasks in the past. Second, I want to explain why jobs have been so important to society and to humans in the past. And third, I want to try to speculate about how that might change in the future if we start developing general artificial intelligence. So let's start by thinking about the past. And I really like to think about this using this metaphor from futurist Hans Moravec. So he asks us to imagine a landscape on one side of the landscape, we have the ocean. In the middle of the landscape, we have the low, lowlands. And at the other side of the landscape, we have a tall mountain. And we can think of this landscape as representing the landscape of human intelligence, with the sea level representing the level or the capabilities of computers and machines. So what has happened historically is that the sea level has been rising. But it has only been rising at some specific areas of this landscape in the lowlands and at the base of the mountain as we automated tasks using narrow, intelligent machinery. So machinery that is very good at doing specific things such as farming, weaving and spinning during the Industrial Revolution. And later we automated other specific tasks such as clerical jobs in office or production works in factory lines with the advent of modern computers. So that was happened historically, but that process has also pushed humans to the top of the mountain and have forced us to specialize at tasks that actually until very recently, many of us thought that were exclusively human. Tasks such as creative thinking, planning, design, research, thinking, or even religious services, yes. I, I would guess. <laughs> And so these all happen at the same time as all of these other tasks are becoming more and more and more important in the economy. And is this mechanism what explains that despite the fact that the sea level has kept rising, we've managed to retain jobs that have produced important functions for us in society, which brings me to point number two. Historically, all of these jobs, in my view, play two key roles. So the first role is that a job is the main source of income for households. So that's the way that we can make a living. That's number one. If you want to consume something, if you want to live a good life, you need to work to earn that. 
Number two, jobs also provide us with a sense of meaning and some sense of fulfillment. So jobs where we can use our diverse talents, our diverse skills in order to participate in markets and society are a way for us to feel important, to, make, to feel that we can make a difference, that we are consequential, that we matter, that others need us. And that's a second very important function that jobs have played historically. Now, how might this change into the future? Well, let's flash forward, I don't know, 100 years from now. Let's look at the very long run. And I don't want to think here about the transition. I really want to think about a future where we have finally developed artificial general intelligence. So it's not just the types of machines that are good at substituting for us at specific tasks at the lowlands, at the basis of the mountains. Now, the sea level has submerged everything. Everything is deep down under the ocean because machines are going to exceed human intelligence at every single task out there. So how does that work look? And is there still a sense of what it means to work in that world? So my claim is that this would be a very different world from the one where we live in. This would be a world where essentially all output, all production of goods and services for practical purposes would be carried out by AI systems. Now, we could work, but whether we decide to do that or not would be essentially irrelevant, would become essentially like a noise in an otherwise perfectly functioning machine. So that to me implies that human work is gonna lose these two key features that it has had historically. Number one, labor income is gonna become increasingly less important in determining how much we get to consume or as a source of your total income. This is not necessarily bad news, actually. This is good news. So this means that we live in a world of abundance. This lives in a world, we're in a world where you don't have to work in order to live a decent life. What we need in this case is just mechanisms to share all of the consumption of those goods and services that are being produced in the back by these AI systems. And the mechanism that we have used historically is to allocate that to the people whose work is more valuable according to the market, but we no longer have to do that. So I think that's a positive outcome. Now, a slightly less negative outcome is that we're gonna lose this ability to use our work as a way to derive meaning and fulfillment. Again, this is a world where we become essentially an error or a noise in this well-functioning machine. So yeah, I could come to BU and teach, but no one is gonna miss me if I'm not here. Because the AIs that are doing the education are so good that it wouldn't really matter. And so I guess that the real question for me of, or the real challenge of thinking what it means to be human in the age of AI is really to try to think about, well, we're in this age of abundance because we're gonna have everything, but at the same time, we're gonna risk becoming irrelevant. And that irrelevance is what worries me a little bit, and it's something that I think we need to figure out ways of redefining ourselves when we can no longer do it to work, as we have done it at least in the last 200 years. It, something came to mind um, when you said that the, fee, the anxiety is, will we be relevant? Yeah. Right? And there is this, um, this cartoon that I show my students when I'm introducing the, the unit on religion and robotics. And it's a, a cartoon that has like a modern age robot um, sort of in the audience, like modern age robots. And then it has an oil can and like an older robot is standing on top of it and it is preaching to the newer age robots. Now no humans are in sight. <laughs> But the older robot who's preaching has this necklace on with a human figure on it. So humans are not there, but humans have become, and he's preaching in the beginning, there were humans and humans <laughs> created us. And so it's something, even though, you know, it's, it, my students sort of laugh at it but then when we seriously sort of dissect what this actually means, students really sort of start to share this sort of anxiety where like what becomes our human, our purpose as humans in a space 
where AI has totally sort of taken over. Like, what is our function? What is our function then? So I just kind of wanted to, I thought about that, <laughs> that imagery when you were talking about that second source of anxiety. And so I think, do we have time for? I think we should probably switch. One more question, or should we switch over to Q&A? Okay, so now you have an opportunity to ask us questions. And I think mics will be, um, it would be great if you can sort of come up and, and use the mic um, so we can all hear you. But now we have time for maybe 15 to 20 minutes of, of Q&A. And if you don't have an opportunity to ask your question or you feel better asking the question at the reception, you can totally wait in, until that time. social worker, so I don't know too much about the topic. That's why I came today. Um, but my question um, was something that Rachel was talking about earlier about um, organisms and machine. So uh, recently I read that some metal can self-heal microscopic chips um, uh, when, when they're you know, under stress. So can you explain, you know, is, I think of metal, I think of like it's used in machinery, how that happens or, because I know like being like an organism, we self heal yeah. and you were talking about that, but they just, <laughs> I read that article and I thought it, it blew my mind. So, okay, so there's only one thing. I, 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 so I'm not like a, an, an engineer uh, that deals with, with substances like that. So I really have no idea how that works. Um, but what I would say is that, um, first of all, you know, and this is sort of what I was getting at earlier, is that you, you know, y y it, if you want to have these really robust systems that are incredibly flexible and versatile, and um, they're going to be highly autonomous, they're going to be highly agentic and, you know, in their own way, um, and they're going to have the kind of healing, growing, metabolizing dynamics that I was talking about. But it's po it, there's no reason to think that that's limited to the kind of carbon structure that we have. So in theory, I mean, you could be constructing organisms. Uh, I mean, look, this is the case for like extraterrestrial life. We don't know the extent to which there are constraints on what the substrate has to be. But you couldn't get that kind of a healing metabolizing aqueous flowing structure um, out of different stuff and th that could be metals or, or whatever um, so there's nothing like that there's no reason to say that, that you couldn't possibly have something like that um, for machines however just having a substance that reforms itself I mean you have to realize like what's going on in an organism like the level of complexity that we're talking about right um, this is where you have just, just extraordinary intricacy of systems and subsystems that are all interconnected. They're connected to some forms of perception, some forms of behavior, um, and uh, internal homeostasis. And, and so, like, and the healing, the mechanisms for healing are extraordinarily complicated. Um, you know, we often use these, like, metaphors, like, oh, you know, the, the ribosome is a factory, or the mitochondrion which, by the way, was once a free-living cell. That's why it has its own uh, free-living U bacterium. That's why it has its own DNA. Or the mitochondria which is the powerhouse of the cell. And we use all of these like machine metaphors, but they couldn't be further from that. Um, and so, like, you know, you, my only point is just to say, like, you know, there's nothing intrinsic to our specific biochemical structure. You could very well have that with metallic structures too. Um, but it's not about like, you know, a particular, it's not just about one aspect. It's the entire organism interlocked in a, in a whole set, a tremendous set of functionalities that are aimed at and designed to promote the self-maintenance of the whole. Um, so that's, I mean, that's the big difference, yeah. Thanks. Hi there. Uh, so the question I had, I think is something that all of you kind of touched on a little bit, 
and I think you ended with it at the end, is this idea that AI is eventually going to progress to a point that we're in a fully functional system, humans might be considered an error. One thing I want to talk about, though, is that we've seen in some usages of AI that there is still a bias within these systems. Mm -hmm. um, back in the earlier, I say earlier days, like it wasn't a few years ago, mm -hmm. but at certain airport security centers, they'll have face recogni facial recognition nowadays to let you onto the plane. Mm -hmm. And one thing that was found is that it worked primarily for white people who were entering the planes. And the machines would keep making mistakes when it came to people of color because it would be like, oh, this facial construction is wrong or it's not a human facial construction. Mm -hmm. And I really wonder, though, that while AI will continue to progress and will continue to become uh, more adept at what tasks it can do, can we really say for sure that it's not going to develop with some kind of bias? Because just because it's going to have maybe a higher form of intelligence that can do all the tasks we do, how do we know that it's not going to come with a bias? Because someone had to first write the program that's evolved into the system, and we don't know if that bias is going to fade out or if it can fade out. So that was just a thought. Excellent. I, I can um, thank you for that, um, for the comment and the question. Um, what's really interesting, this is a really good question because it sort of goes back to what, you know, my comments in the very beginning that when we talk about sort of this, when we question, we have this question about human agency and AI, we're speaking as if we have this monolithic understanding of humans and that's just not the case. And when you look at AI, like face, facial recognition, like it has already been proven that it does not work well with dark, like pheno, certain phenotypes. And a lot of that has to do with like the actual testing of the AI systems are done on a particular sub, subgroup of individuals, white males normally. And so you have this technology that's being developed and it's going to be utilized. We see they were using it with police surveillance. You know, they use it in banks where AI sort of tags a certain name and denies because of that name, denies the law. I mean, so you see these biases. What I'm saying is a, these artificial intelligence are basically replicating what is actually in the society because humans are involved. And so it's really interesting. I, I study gamers. I'm a gamer myself and I study gamers and this one particular black gamer said, oh, I got this new technology that's supposed to be, you know, supposed to be motion censored, but it doesn't work for me because of my skin color. And he said, Man, he didn't say man, but you know, <laughs> this is an endowed lecture, so I'll say man, you know, technology, particular artificial, you know, generated technologies are always reminding me that I'm black. That's a serious statement to make, right? And I think about sort of the sea rising, right? Like this wonderful metaphor that you gave of the sea rising. And I'm just thinking when you're like, what are humans are supposed to do? And I'm just like, oh my goodness, what are marginalized communities in that world? What are they going to do? Dr. Gilroy, I want to interrupt you because I had a similar thought to flesh out the idea. A more recent case of something that's happened with other marginalized communities is, I believe it was on Tumblr, um, when posts were made by trans women just talking about their bodies, the AI system on Tumblr would start to flag them as that is sexual content. This yeah. is inappropriate content. And it made me wonder that while the sea level will rise, who is actually going to get drowned first by that system? Ooh. That's, uh, that, was, that was my thought. Can, can I add something Yes, 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 yes. So I think that, that this is actually quite important because there's nothing in the way that AI is developing that suggests that its future path is one where there's no bias and mm -hmm. it would work perfectly for everyone. This is a societal problem, so it depends on us to eliminate this problem. But I think it's very important to try to eliminate and control this problem before we are underwater. Because at that point, it's going to be so powerful compared to anything that we can do that there's nothing that we're going to be able to do to control it. And so, you know, like I use this metaphor that we eventually become like noise, like an error term, 
We want to make sure that when that happens, that AI system is already optimizing for everyone in society mm. and not just for some particular groups. How would we go about doing that? That's a good question. I don't know. <laughs> I'm also taking enough time. Thank you for thank your you. First of all, I just want, would want to say thank you to all four of you for your insights. My question is um, thinking a little bit about consciousness um, because so much of what we have talked about has been about individual consciousness, about our own personal individual perspective. Um, but I'm also interested in the ways that AI technology or speculations or sci-fi writing has written of AI as being able to kind of transcend that individual conscious boundary. So I'm thinking collective consciousness. Um, we've talked a little bit about how you know, even us humans are, you know, macro systems of microorganisms, you know, even digestion is something that takes more than just us. Um, but also Dr. Guillory, um, thinking with you a little bit, you know, the sociologist Emil Durkheim suggested that humans sometimes behave collectively, um, collective effervescence. There's a way that, you know, sometimes when we are caught up in experience, social experiences, we cease to become individuals and we become collectives doing things. So how can we understand AI and collective co uh, consciousness while thinking about the ways that collective consciousness already exists in this world? You want this one? Either way. Well, collective consciousness, yeah. So, so I think you're right that um, at the moment, when we think about consciousness, it's often thinking about an individual level consciousness. Um, but I want to make a connection to other kinds of um, emergent systems in mm -hmm. nature um, where you know, maybe we can make a nice analogy. So for example, we might think of an ant colony, right? Um, the individual ant um, operates according to fairly deterministic rules. Um, but when you put a lot of ants together in a a colony, now you have this emergent behavior that is very complex and that is much more intelligent than the behavior of any individual ant. So I think the question you're asking about consciousness is something similar, right? It's sort of like, could there ever be a kind of ant colony consciousness or you know, a network of AIs hooked together that now have this super consciousness? Um, and the answer is, we have no idea. <laughs> Be because again, we, we don't really have a theory of how consciousness can come about. But you know, if, you, if consciousness is a product of some sort of, um, let's say, functional properties of how our neurons in our brains communicate and talk to each other, you can almost think of the brain as a big collection of units that are talking to each other and generating this conscious experience. So if it, it's something like, if there's a functional account of consciousness that ends up being right, um, you could imagine hooking all kinds of things together to end up generating consciousness. Now I think um, one thing that at the moment is very special about our consciousness, our conscious experience, is that each person's conscious experience is their own. It's specific. It comes from your particular history. It comes from your particular experiences and, your, and, and gives you a particular way of looking at the world. And this is what we value in you know, reading our favorite author or something like that. We want to know what's their particular insight and way of looking at the world. If we start to imagine a more collective kind of consciousness, like a, a machine consciousness based on, let's say, all of the data in the internet or something like mm -hmm. that. Now this is a very different thing, right? This becomes um, a somewhat generic consciousness, a consciousness that uh, aggregates over lots and lots and lots of people's experiences or data or so on and so forth. So just a few but, things there. But, I mean, if we were able to answer your question, I mean, we would be famous. <laughs> no, no, I, but ser seriously though, I mean, so like I work on superorganisms, right? And ant colony is sort of uh, classic yeah. examples of that. Oh, I love bees. Yeah, <laughs> good. <laughs> um, so yeah, so we're on the same page. So I think, um, but 
I can tell you, and I've been like actually working on some of this, trying, so I want, to, so we talk about super organisms and I'm interested in the idea of super subjects. Mm -hmm. The problem is, of course, first of all, no one knows what consciousness comes from. So like, you, how do you even begin to approach the question? I mean, second of all, like I can tell you, like I can't, like for me, I can't, like I could just put all of, all of the literature together and everything we know and it would be, insanely difficult or impossible to make the, the, the argument for consciousness at the level of the ant colony, which is like the best example we have organismically of something like that. Um, and there's like a whole ton of reasons for it. But, but the reality is like, it's such an ontological mess that like, I mean, you, you know, we say we have a subject, we have a first person perspective, but nobody knows whether there are levels of consciousness within our organism, within our brain, within our individual cells, like no one knows. And, and you know, it's like we want to say we have a single subject, we treat it that way for legal and moral purposes and there's good reasons for that and everything, but no one knows, like do we have nested experiencers within, right? And that's all part of the same question. And once you start opening it up to that possibility, I actually think that we probably don't have any idea of how to talk about it anymore. Yeah. Um, it's very hard, it's really hard in itself just to um, make cognition attributions to groups. Um, I think that's really difficult. Like just to, to even say that, you know, I mean, yes, there's a lot of information processing going on, but to say that this, this group has a certain mental state or certain beliefs, mm -hmm. it's not, a, I'm not saying it's impossible. I'm just saying like these are extraordinarily difficult cases to make. So it's, it's easy for us to talk loosely about it and it's absolutely possible but no one's really been able to show that definitively. So we have time for one more, one more question, you think? Oh, two more questions? Okay. Hi, uh, my name is Kira. I have a question about, um, I guess, the threat that AI poses because a common conversation that's happening, especially in media and in the political sphere, is how to regulate AI for safe development. Um, but the thing is, those discussions, those conversations don't usually name what the threat is. So I wanted to mm. sort of ask what you think, is it like a threat to our humanity? Is it like a physical like Terminator style threat? Um, <laughs> or maybe like a threat of misuse and misappropriation, like human use of technology? Like what do you guys think it is? Okay, so I think that, that the threats depend a little bit on the time frame that you have in mind. So there are threats that are very immediate such as disinformation, the, the creation of disinformation campaigns, for example, using ChatGPT, even though we said that we were not gonna talk about it, but that would be an immediate threat. But I think that in the longer horizon there are, I do think that there are also more existential uh, threats. I don't think that that's what they have in mind at this point where they're thinking about regulating it, but I do think that that's a possibility going forward. And I think that the way to think about some of these existential threats is that when you're training or when you're generating these AI systems, essentially you are embedding some objectives in the system and it's not clear what those objectives are. So for example, if I program a software to play chess, it's very clear that that software only knows how to play chess and that's the only thing that it's gonna do. But when I create an AI system to handle the world economy, I don't really know exactly what is it that it's trying to achieve and how and that might create, or that might have lots of repercussions for humans. So if you manage to, to create the right objectives, then it's great, you have this perfect machine that essentially maximizes human well-being for the rest of times. But what do we mean by maximizing human well-being? How do we even communicate that objective to the AI system? How do we know that it's not going to find another crazy solution to something that looks a lot like that objective, but that ends up essentially using us all to get matter and energy and disintegrating us. So I don't think it's so much like a Terminator a scenario where it's gonna like just use all of its intelligence to build robots and come and attack us. It's just something like more subtle. It's you create this powerful system, you lose control and that powerful system, you better make sure that you put in the right objectives because before you give it the driving seat. So it's also related to the question of bias, all of that. Like if you create a bias system, then that's it. Yeah. You cannot hold it anymore. <laughs> These are, so this is what like, so the philosopher um, in Oxford, Nick Bostrom, was the Future of Humanity Institute there that I was um, part of for a short time. Um, Nick Bostrom has this book called Superintelligence, which kind of put this 
these worries on the map, you can read it and you will have nightmares. It will yeah. like knock your socks off. It did for me when I read it. Um, uh, you know, if you think it's kind of a joke, just like, you know, oh, AI, give me a break. You pop out the battery and the battle's over, right? No. <laughs> so <laughs> so he, I think it makes a persuasive case that there, there are things to be worried about. Um, but like, so that, like he talks about these, what he calls perverse instantiations, which are this idea like you tell, like, oh, make everybody, you know, act so that everybody's happy. So then what it does is just like, you know, hook everybody up to a machine that just feeds like massive pleasurable uh, experiences into their heads because that's what it thought was the right thing to do. So there are these communication problems. I just want to pick up on one thing, uh, one problem from the standpoint of like evolutionary biology, which um, relates to this problem of control. You say, what are the specific threats? Part of the problem, I think, is that we don't know what they are yet, um, and we won't know. And so I think the big difference, so the way I think about AI right now, you know, you, we, we, going back to that question, are they artifacts, are they descendants? The answer is, I think, I think they're neither. They will be neither once they're generally intelligent. Um, you know, I think of them as a, a, like a domesticated species that we're co-evolving with. But the really big difference that I think should raise eyebrows, or you know, maybe in a peak of interest, but maybe in, a, in, in sheer fright, is that there are some key differences with past episodes of domestication. So like, you know, the reason why we have very successful domestications of animals in the past is because we can control the reproductive life cycles of these animals. We can control their reproduction. And we just select for the behaviors that we want. We don't really know how their minds work. We have no idea. We don't know how their minds produce the behaviors they do, but it doesn't matter. We just make sure they're done reliably, and those are the ones we select. We're going to do the same thing with AI. But I, the way I, from my perspective, I think the big problem is we're not going to be able to control AI reproduction because, you know, uh, animals would take, you know, thousands of years to produce populations, blah, blah, blah. But, you know, AI is going to, could, could, we could increase its population astronomically, literally, I don't know, seconds, minutes, days, right? And we won't be able to control their reproduction. So we won't be able to control how their motivations even change, even if we got it right and we plugged in the right value structure, whatever that means. Um, and then they're going to take their own evolutionary path. It's an evolutionary system. Um, if you think about biology very broadly, it's just having, you know, you're going to have evolution whenever you have variation that's, her that's heritable and it's connected to differential survival and reproduction. And you're going to have that with these systems probably. And they're going to just take off. And they're going to go their own way. And I don't know if it'll be good and I don't know if it'll be bad. But here's the only thing I, I kind of was thinking about, the only thing I, I, that kind of does worry me. Um, is what would be actually, a, I, mean, I don't know if it's good that humans are here. Like, I don't know if it's overall good for our world that we continue to be, live indefinitely. I think that's an open question. Um, but um, it, it would, the, the biggest worry that I would have about it is that whatever does come and replace us, if it indeed does, like in the scenarios that Pasquale was talking about, and, which didn't sound just like work, I mean, it sounded like you're, it's going to go past that point, right? Um, and I guess my worry is like, if you're not, if you're able to create these general intelligence systems that are not conscious, that don't have the capacities that we think are morally valuable, and yet they have that power and they replace us, what a travesty that would be. So it seems really important that they're actually conscious and rational and moral and all of these things so that if down the road, you know, looking back on Earth's stratigraphy, right, in the fossil record, you see a whole bunch of human skeletons for a little while, and then a, quarter, a very brief moment, right, of humans and machine skeletons, and then it's going to be all machines, hmm. right? Um, if that's the case, like, at least if the machines themselves are conscious and they, they have a moral value that's equivalent to ours or or maybe even greater, um, it, you know, at least we would have, we would be able to say that we were replaced by something better. What a travesty it would be is if these intelligent machines had no inner life, had no value, had no, didn't care about anything, and yet re replaced us. That would be a travesty. Mm. Thank you Thank for you. your question. Well, on that note, I think we will... <coughs> Wow, um, this was a very interesting and um, 
thought-provoking and provocative <laughs> panel today. Just what we hoped for. So thank you all for <laughs> especially our moderator, uh, Dr. Guillory. Thank you. And of course, a big thank you to Jerry Gittner and his family. Uh, we are so fortunate to have your support for this endowed lecture. The next lecture in the Arts and, Sci Arts and Sciences Lecture Series will be on December 4th, the Howard Zinn Memorial Lecture, which this year will be given by Jules Gil -Peter Peterson, Associate Professor of History at Johns Hopkins University. And the topic of that lecture will be what sort of work is transition, question mark, class, labor, and trans history? We hope everyone here will join us for this next lecture, lecture on December 4th. Finally, it's my pleasure to invite everyone to please join us for the reception. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.